People in Chile are recovering from a powerful earthquake that struck off the northern coast. At least six people are dead. The tremor triggered tsunami that hit the country's shores and prompted alerts over the Pacific. The Pacific Tsunami Warning Center says the magnitude 8.2 earthquake struck before 9 p.m. local time on Tuesday. Interior Ministry officials say six people died, some of them after being crushed by buildings. It was very strong and long. Everything moved. All we could do was pray with our daughter. People in the region have been feeling continuing tremors. The U.S. Geological Survey says a magnitude 6.2 aftershock was recorded north of the port city of Iquique. Several fires broke out and the city's electricity supply has been disrupted. Tsunami with a height of up to 2.1 meters were observed in Iquique and other places along the northern Chilean coast. A tidal change of 10 centimeters was observed on Easter Island, about 3,800 kilometers west of the mainland. A tsunami advisory has been issued for the U.S. state of Hawaii. Officials at the Meteorological Agency in Tokyo say the tsunami triggered by Chile's earthquake may reach as far as Japan. We estimate there is the possibility advisory level tsunami could reach Japan on the Pacific side. The height of such tsunami could be from 20 centimeters up to one meter. Officials said waves could reach the Pacific coasts between 5 a.m. and 8 a.m. Japan time on Thursday, but they are still analyzing data to decide whether to issue an advisory. People in Japan's coastal areas are taking precautions. They are shutting water gates and moving boats to safety. My house was flooded last time. So I'm going to put our stuff up high. My boat is anchored at the port. It's my precious asset. I want to make sure it won't get damaged. Chile is one of the most seismically active countries in the world. The oceanic Nazca plate collides with the continental South American plate to form the deep Peru-Chile trench. The area has triggered earthquakes and tsunami throughout history. The strongest and most destructive quake ever recorded in the world hit in 1960. The magnitude 9.5 quake unleashed tsunami in regions across the Pacific Ocean, causing damage in Hawaii, Japan, and the Philippines. Waves slammed into the northeastern coast of Japan 23 hours after killing about 140 people. In 2010, a magnitude 8.8 .8 quake in Chile again triggered tsunami across the Pacific. It reached the northeastern coast of Japan but caused no major damage. Utility companies in Japan are working their way through long safety checklists as they try to win approval to restart nuclear reactors. Their plants must comply with tougher regulations and be equipped to deal with emergencies. So one thing they are doing is investing in cutting-edge technology to be better prepared. NHK World's Noriko Okada shows us how. It works slowly and methodically, but it gets the job done. These engineers are learning how to manipulate remote control robots to deal with nuclear plant emergencies. Step by step, they perform increasingly complex operations at this training facility. Companies that operate nuclear plants are funding the projects. Guiding the robots with precision takes skill, and it's difficult to judge situations based on video alone. Nuclear plants have doors and steps like these. Through trial and error, we've been trying different ways of getting robots to move through such obstacles. Utility companies have applied for permission to restart their nuclear reactors. All 48 of Japan's reactors are currently offline.
Each plant must pass safety standards to go back online. Utility managers say robots will allow them to respond more quickly and effectively to emergencies and reduce risks at the same time. But teaching people how to operate these devices is only the first step. The accident at the Fukushima Daiichi has demonstrated the limits of technology. Engineers admit they still have a long way to go to develop better machines. We're using robots that are developed for military use and other purposes. So if we bring them into power plants, we'll have to find our own way to modify them to suit the needs of a nuclear emergency. Nuclear regulators have ordered operators to put measures in place to deal with all stages of an accident, such as the release of radiation or damage to fuel rods. Robotic technology is just one part of the equation. People in Japan are growing concerned about elderly residents who fled communities around the damaged nuclear plant in Fukushima. They're worried the prolonged evacuation could be triggering dementia. It's happened before following past disasters. NHK World's Marina Shirakawa reports. This is how Sai Shiga spends most of her days, sitting in her apartment near Tokyo and thinking. But recently, the 91-year-old has been losing her sense of time and place. I haven't been here for a long time, around 10 days. I just came by this house for a visit. I'm going back to Fukushima soon. In fact, Shiga has been living here with one of her five children for nearly three years. They are from the city of Minamisoma, about 20 kilometers from the Fukushima Daiichi plant. They had to leave in 2011 after the nuclear accident. Her son Yoshinori says Shiga began showing symptoms of dementia last summer. She would go for walks and get lost. Yoshinori said she needs constant supervision and he can't work. So they get by on compensation from the operator of the damaged plant. Shiga keeps repeating she wants to go back home, but the memory of home is fading. What do you think this is? It might be something I saw before. Professor Kiyoshi Maeda tracked the rise in dementia cases following the 1995 earthquake in Kobe. He says the impact of the prolonged Fukushima evacuation could be worse. When that kind of hardship continues over a long period of time, it increases the risk of developing dementia. Yoshinori is trying to prevent his mother's condition from deteriorating. He buys flowers because she used to teach flower arrangement. It shuts her up, but makes him realize how much of his mother he has lost. Why do we have to suffer like this? If we could have stayed home, we'd have had no problem. Time has stopped since the evacuation. Time has stopped for everyone. Shiga can't go home until workers decontaminate her neighborhood and government officials lift an evacuation order. <laughs> Nobody is sure when that will happen or how much she will remember 
Let me begin with breaking news. Hundreds of Hanford employees have initiated a stop work order, angry about workers getting sick from exposure to some toxic chemical vapors. King 5 investigator Susanna Frame broke the story on Twitter and joins us now with the rest of the story. Susanna. Gene and Dennis, two Hanford employees say they have had enough. They've ordered a work stoppage for their co-workers after getting what they call the runaround about the rash of recent vapor exposures to employees. Within the last two weeks, 24 Hanford workers have been rushed to the hospital or to Hanford's on-site medical center after inhaling sudden releases of toxic vapors and getting reactions like difficulty breathing, bloody noses, rapid heartbeat, and even coughing up blood. Now employees in support positions such as crane operators, truck drivers, security officers, and carpenters say they're not going back near that part of Hamford until they get correct, real-time information about what's going on. About an hour or so ago, I spoke with a worker in Richland who initiated the order by telephone. It's extremely frustrating for, for, the, for the workers. Uh, you know, you know, sometimes we have to find out, you know, we, we learn more watching the news or reading the newspaper than our employer is, is telling us or the Department of Energy is telling us. Uh, so it's, it's, just, it's extremely frustrating. So the support workers who are forbidden from entering what's called the tank farm area at Hanford, they all work for the contractor Mission Support Alliance, or MSA. There are about 500 MSA workers off the job right now. Today they did begin to get better information in some meetings, but the work stoppage is expected to last a few more days, and not having those guys out there is a big disruption. Mm -hmm. Very important uh, services. All right, Susanna, thank you. And now to you. Carlsbad, New Mexico, where the Department of Energy says four more workers were contaminated with low-level of radiation during a leak at the federal government's underground nuclear waste dump. The DOE now says that tests show a total of 21 workers have received low doses of radiation. Today, the department said it plans to send a team of eight experts into the mine to begin setting up bases from which they can start investigating what caused the leak. The waste isolation pilot plant is the nation's only permanent underground repository for low-level radioactive waste from nuclear weapons facilities. However, the facility has been out of operation since February when a sharp rise in radiation levels was leak, linked excuse me, to a leak in one of the underground tunnels storing radioactive waste about 600 meters underground. This radiation eventually made it into the plant's surrounding area and was detected in the air by nearby monitoring stations. Despite the alarming news, plant and government officials have maintained that the amount of radiation released does not constitute a threat to public health.